Chapter 3 of the AEF, with General Pershing and the American Forces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The AEF, with General Pershing and the American Forces, by Haywood Brown. Chapter 3, Lafayette, Nous Voilà. The Navy was the first to take Paris. While the doughboys were still at the port crowding themselves into camp, lucky sailors were on their way to let the French capital see the American uniform. I came up on the night train with a crowd of them. Their pockets bulged with money, tins of salmon, ham, and truffled chicken. They had chocolate in their hats and boxes of fancy crackers under their arms while cigars and cigarettes poked out of their blouses. They would have nothing to do with French tobacco, but favored a popular American brand which sells for a quarter in New York and twice as much over here. One almost expected each sailor to produce a roast turkey or a pheasant from up his sleeve at mealtime, but it was pretty much all mealtime for these men who were making their shore leave an intensive affair. One was a very new sailor, and he was rejoicing to find land under his feet again. Oh boy, he said, when I asked him about his ship, that old tub had two more movements than a hula dancer. The little group in my compartment was sampling some champagne which hospitable folk at the port had given them. It was not real champagne, to be sure, but a cheaper white wine with twice as many bubbles and at least as much noise. It sufficed very well, since it was ostentation rather than thirst which spurred the sailors on, and they spread their hospitality throughout the train. A few French soldiers headed back for the trenches were the traveling companions of the Americans. The Poilus were decidedly friendly, but somewhat amazed at the big men who made so much noise with their jokes and their songs. Of course, the French were called upon to sample the various tinned and bottled goods which the sailors were carrying. It was, have a swig of this, froggy, or get yourself around that, Frenchy. The Americans were still just a bit condescending to their brothers in arms. They had not yet seen them in action. Of course, there was much comparison of equipment, and the sailors all tried on the trench helmets of the French and found them too small. The Entente grew, and presently there was an allied concert. The sailors sang, What a Wonderful Mother You'd Make, and the French replied with the Verdun song, Ils ne passeront pas, and later with Madelon. I heard that song many times afterwards, and it always brings to mind a picture of dusty French soldiers marching with their short, quick, eager stride. They are always dusty. All summer long they wear big overcoats which come below the knee. Dust settles and multiplies, and if you see a French regiment marching in the spring rainy season, it will still be dusty. Perhaps their soles are a little dusty now, but it is French dust. And as they march, they sing as the men sang to the newly arrived Americans in the train that night. For all the soldiers on their holidays, there is a place just tucked in by the woods, a house with ivy growing on the walls, a cabaret, au Toulourou, the goods. The girl who serves is young and sweet as love. She's light as any butterfly in spring. Her eyes have got a sparkle like her wine. We call her Madelon. It's got a swing. The soldier's girl. She leads us all a dance. She's only Madelon, but she's romance. When Madelon comes out to serve us drinks, we always know she's coming by her song. And every man, he tells his little tale, and Madelon, she listens all day long. Our Madelon is never too severe. A kiss or two is nothing much to her. She laughs us up to love and life and God. Madelon, Madelon, Madelon. We all have girls for keeps that wait at home who'll marry us when fighting time is done. But they are far away, too far to tell, what happens in these days of cut and run. We sigh away such days as best we can, 
and pray for time to bring us near our home. But tales like ours won't wait till then to tell. We have to run and boast to Madelon. We steal a kiss. She takes it all in play. We dream she is that other, far away. A corporal with a feather in his cap went courting Madelon one summer's day. And, mad with love, he swore she was superb, and he would wed her any day, she'd say. But Madelon was not for any such. She danced away and laughed, my stars above. Why, how could I consent to marry you when I have my whole regiment to love? I could not choose just one and leave the rest. I am the soldier's girl. I like that best. When Madelon comes out to serve us drinks, we always know she's coming by her song. And every man, he tells his little tale. And Madelon, she listens all day long. Our Madelon is never too severe. A kiss or two is nothing much to her. She laughs us up to love and life and God. Madelon, Madelon, Madelon. When the train came into Paris early the next morning, the sailors were singing the chorus with the Poilus. They parted company at the Quai d'Orsay. The soldiers went to the front, the sailors turned to Paris. It was a Paris such as no one had ever seen before. The bannière étoilée was everywhere. We call it the Stars and Stripes. Little flags were stuck rakishly behind the ears of disreputable Parisian cab horses. Bigger flags were in the windows of the shops and on top of buildings, but the biggest American flag of all hung on the Strasbourg Monument, which shed its mourning when the war began. Two days later all the flags were fluttering, for on the morning of the 3rd of July the doughboys came to Paris. It made no difference that they were only a battalion. When the French saw them they thought of armies and of new armies, for these were the first soldiers in many months who smiled as they marched. The train was late, but the crowd waited outside the Gare d'Austerlitz for more than two hours. French Red Cross nurses were waiting at the station, and the doughboys had their first experience with French rations, for they began the long day with petit déjeuner. Men brought up on ham and eggs and flapjacks and oatmeal and even breakfast pie found war bread and coffee a scant repast, but the ration proved more popular than was expected when it was found that the coffee was charged with cognac. It was a stronger stimulant, though, which sent the men on the tips of their toes as they swung down the street, covering thirty-two inches with each stride. For the first time they heard the roar of a crowd. It was not the steady roar such as comes from American throats. It was split up into Vive les Etats-Unis and Vive l'Amérique, with an occasional Vive le Président Wilson. This appearance was only a dress rehearsal, and the troops were hurried through little fre frequented streets to a barracks to await the morning of the 4th. Paris began the great day by waking Pershing with music. The band of the Republican Guard was at the gate of his house a little after 8 o'clock. The rest of Paris seemed to have had no trouble in arousing itself without music, for already several hundred thousand persons were crowded about the General's Hotel. First there were trumpets, then brasses blared and drums rumbled. The general proved himself a light sleeper and a quick dresser. Before the last note of the fanfare died away, he was at the window and bowing to the crowd. This time there was a solid roar, for everybody shouted, Vive Pershing! The band cut through the din. There were a few strange variations and uncertainties in the tune, but it was unmistakably the Star-Spangled Banner. Only a handful in the crowd knew the American National Anthem, but they shouted chapeau, chapeau, so hard that everybody took up the cry and took off his hat. There was a fine, indefinite, noisy roar which would have done credit to a double-header crowd at the polo grounds when Pershing left his hotel for the Invalide, where the march of the Americans was to begin. It was pleasant to observe at that moment that our commander has as straight a back as any man in the Allied armies can boast. At least 400,000 people were crowded around the Invalides. Mm. They had plenty of chance to shout. 
They were able to keep their enthusiasm within bounds when first Poincaré appeared and then Pinlevé. The next celebrity was Papa Joffre, and hats went into the air. There was an interval of waiting then and a bit of a riot. An old man who found the elbows of his neighbors disagreeable exclaimed, Oh, let me have peace. Somebody who heard the word peace shouted, He's a pacifist, and people near at hand began to hit at him. He was saved by the coming of the American soldiers. Vive les teddies, eh, shouted the crowd and forgot the old man. The crowd made way for the Americans as they marched toward the Invalides and into the courtyard where the trophies won from the Germans are displayed. You will bring more from the bush, shouted a Frenchman. French and American flags floated above the guns and aeroplanes and minenwerfers. During the short ceremony, the American soldiers looked about curiously at the trophies and up at the dome above the tomb of Napoleon. Many knew him by reputation, and some had heard that he was buried there. After a short ceremony, the Americans marched out of the Invalides and toward the Picpou Cemetery. The crowds had increased. It was hard marching now. French children ran in between the legs of the soldiers. French soldiers and civilians crowded in upon them. It was impossible to keep ranks. Now the men in khaki were just a little brown steam twisting and turning in an effort to get onward. People threw roses at the soldiers, and they stuffed them into their hats and in the gun barrels. It was reported from several sources that one or two soldiers who were forced out of ranks were kissed, but no one would admit it afterwards. The youngsters in their ranks tried their best to keep a military countenance. They endeavored to achieve an expression which should be polite but firm, an air of having been through the same experience many times before. Only one or two old sergeants succeeded. The rest blushed under the cheers and entangling interest of the crowd, and they could not keep the grins away when people shouted, Vive les teddies, or threw roses at them. On that morning it was great to be young and a doughboy. On and on they went past high walls and gardens to the edge of the city to a cemetery. There were speeches here, and they were mostly French. Ribot spoke, and Penlevé and Pershing. His was English, and he said, I hope, and I would like to say it, that here on the soil of France, and in the school of the French heroes, our American soldiers may learn to battle and to vanquish for the liberty of the world. But the speech which left the deepest impression was the shortest of all. Colonel Stanton stood before the tomb of Lafayette and made a quick, sharp gesture which was broad enough to include the youngsters from Alabama and Texas and Massachusetts and Ohio and the rest. Lafayette, we're here, he said. End of chapter 3